So it's uh, nice being here. I'm uh, Konstantinos. I indeed work in Google. And uh, I work as an associate account strategist. Uh, in a daily basis, I actually talk with a handful of businesses. So before I came here today, I asked myself the following. What is one of the most burning questions that digital marketeers have nowadays? And it's a fundamental question. It's actually how do consumers and shoppers make their purchases online and how can digital marketeers affect those decisions? So I'm going to inform you on how consumers make those decisions, but before I do that, I'd like you to show you this. It's an oversimplified purchase journey from the moment someone has the trigger to buy something, so he gets in the market to buy something, till the moment of the purchase. Now, marketeers used to use this marketing funnel over there on the, on the left. But today I'll show you the way that this marketing funnel has changed and how digital marketeers can adapt to this change. Now, if you were to sketch what's happening in this messy middle from the trigger to the purchase, you would most likely sketch something like this. Because online shoppers are exposed to an immense amount of information online. They have the search engines, they have the aggregators, they have online reviews, they have social media, they have everything. So what Google researchers did were to actually find that a way to decode this messy middle. And they found out that during their shopping journey, consumers are in either one of the two mental states of either exploration or evaluation. So we've brought some order to the chaos. And today I will show you how we can apply some tiny bits of behavioral science to influence the efficiency of how users go from the trigger to the purchase. Now, we will not talk about brand strategy. We will not talk about pricing strategy. We've seen that the majority of the shoppers are either won or lost in this messy middle. So we are going to see specifically what's going on there. These are six of the most important behavioral biases that shoppers use when they shop. So let's go uh, to cover them one by one. Category heuristics. These are just category key specifications of, of products that make the shoppers decide on which product to use. It's just a very fundamental behavioral bias. Is it organic or is it not organic? It helps people jump from the exploration to the evaluation. So when they go to the evaluation, they start pushing brands aside because they might not be organic, for example. Then we have the social norms, social proof. We see that all the time in Google My Business. We have the reviews. People tend to follow the majority. And then we go to the authority bias, the sibling of the social norms, where it's just the fact that people tend to overestimate the, the knowledge and opinion of credible and knowledgeable experts. Now, there are three more. And before I cover them, um, I have a surprise. We're actually going to see later in the presentation how these behavioral biases have an exact impact in a real life scenario. So we are going to quantify the impact that these behavioral biases can have for your own brand. So we have the power of now. There's nothing like the present. Of course, consumers prefer something to have it now instead of in the future. We have the scarcity bias. It's a bias that makes people think that whatever is limited has a higher uh, value. And we have the power of free. Whenever we offer to consumers something for free, they tend to overestimate the value that they get for that, for that free product. So, Google researchers and uh, behavioral architects, a global consulting group, prepared their simulation with over, I think, 300,000 shoppers, and they came with some results. But before I show you the results, I want to show you the methodology so you can follow me along. They said to the shoppers, I want you to give me your favorite brand, and I want you to give me your second favorite brand for a specific category. To make it easier, let's say that we are talking about cars, and you are the shopper. Let's say that you're the shopper. You might choose Land Rover as your first uh, brand and Audi as your second brand, right? Now, what they did was they started supercharging the second brand with all those behavioral biases to see how the brand preference switched from the one brand to the other. So we're indeed going to talk about cars. And there was a, a specific reason why I chose this category. It's an expensive category. And the consumers are very loyal in this category, right? 
So someone wouldn't guess that behavioral science applied to this category wouldn't have much of an impact, right? Let's see. So this was the simulation. Consumers were presented with their favorite brand and their second favorite brand in a control environment where they could change one thing at a time and we could quantify the impact of the thing that changed. Keep in mind that before they were presented with any other brand, the first brand had 100% of the brand preference. Now, something that shocked me when I was actually reading this uh, research was that by just showing the second brand, 35 of consumers changed their mind. That means that from mere exposure, one third of consumers, by being exposed to the competitor, can just change their mind. Now, let's see how this percentage might drop or increase by applying those behavioral biases that I mentioned before. So, we added the category heuristics. We said that the second brand has a five-year new car warranty versus an infotainment system included in the first brand. You see that we apply a much more impactful uh, category heuristic to the second brand. We also applied the power of free. We said that the second brand will have free service for three years versus the fir first brand, which is going to have just a check worth of 5,000 euros or dollars for accessories. Now, you wouldn't think that offering something for free would, say, would make much of a difference when buying a car, right? But the results were the exact opposite. 65% of consumers have now switched their brand preference from the Land Rover to the Audi. And again, Land Rover and Audi are just for illustrative purposes. They, these brands weren't used in the actual research, okay? So I will take a step back for a minute because I would like you to think that we didn't tell them about the terms and conditions, sorry. We, we didn't tell them about the terms and conditions of the warranty. We didn't tell them anything about the free service. This peace of mind that those behavioral biases allowed the consumers to have to escape this messy middle that we were discussing previously made them switch their brand preference to the degree of 65%. Now let's go and supercharge the second brand with even more behavioral biases. We said that the second brand has a five-star rating versus the, set, the first brand, which, which had a, a third-star uh, rating. We applied the authority bias. We put some stamps into the second brand versus the first brand, which had nothing. We applied the power of now and said that the second brand has immediate delivery, but the first brand, in order to get it, you have to wait four to six weeks. Last but not least, we also applied the scarcity bias by saying that the offer in the second brand is valid, at, valid until the end of the month. Now let's see the results that this bias has had in switching the brand preference from one brand to the other. 80% of people now chose Audi. So this is like an, a very emphatic illustration of how fluid uh, the decision-making of shoppers is nowadays. Shoppers are being exposed to such a vast amount of information that just by applying behavioral science in the, in the messy middle, I'm not talking about branding, I'm not talking about uh, pricing, can change brand preference from the first brand to the second brand by 80%. And I'd like to go and a step even further here. Who has ever heard of uh, Tucan? Great. I was afraid to see any hands because Tucan doesn't exist. Researchers from Google actually built that brand and they tried to supercharge it with all the behavioral biases to see how much of brand preference Tucan would steal out of the dominant brand. And here is what they found. 63% of people that have never heard of Tucan before actually said that they would prefer it out of the dominant brand only by being exposed to their own behavioral biases. So, I want to show you, uh, I know that for most of you, the car categories is not very relevant. So, I want to show you that the results you saw were similar across several categories. What you see here is actually the percentage that the second brand managed to win over the, sec over the first brand just by showing up. It was the, the first part of the chart that we saw in the beginning. So, across retail, across FMCG, across whatever you put it, financial services, business services, just showing up matters. And the second graph here shows what 
fictitious brands, so what fake brands managed to steal of brand preference from the first brands just by, having, by being supercharged uh, with the behavioral sciences. So let's take, an ex let's take an example here just so you can understand what exactly I'm talking about. We see makeup here. 70% of shoppers chose a brand that they knew nothing before just because this brand was supercharged by the behavioral biases we saw. So, what does this mean for established brands and challenger brands? For established brands, it means that they can lose consumers uh, faster than ever before, so they need to be present uh, more than ever. And for challenger brands, that shows a tremendous opportunity to enter new markets and influence the consumer decision-making process. So as I mentioned in the beginning, I will also provide you with some actionable items to follow in case you'd like to apply behavioral science in your marketing plan. First of all, you need to have presence because on average 30% of shoppers switch just like that. They might switch their, their preference just like that. Their decision-making process is just very fluid. Invite a renowned expert in your category to talk about your product or get active in exposing your product uh, to relevant blogs and articles written from experts. You can even uh, invite an influencer, of course. So scarcity, but do it carefully, because we've seen that scarcity as a behavioral bias is the one that can bring negative results if overdone. It might remind some people of fraud, for example. Build ways or platforms to showcase social proof. Google My Business is a great way to do that. You can advertise it as well, uh, but I promise I won't be here today selling you Google Ads. Understand which characteristics of your product and service your consumers most associate with and make a conscious effort to integrate those into your ad copy, your messaging. And last but not least, find a part of your, of your service that you could offer for free because consumers value that much more than its actual worth and we've seen that this can bring back to the business a disproportionate amount of value and revenue. Thank you very much.